Welcome to another edition of the Law and Gospel Devotional. My name is Eric Sorensen, and each week we gather with you to look at God's two words, both his word of law, which tells us all that we're supposed to do, and unfortunately points out the many ways in which we haven't done it, and his word of gospel, which ultimately tells us all that God has done for us and our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, folks, it is good to be here with you again to look at God's word Especially this week, because this week is Here We Still Stand Week, a time each year, usually towards the end of October, where the folks of 1517, along with many friends of ours, gather in San Diego, California at Mission Bay, really to celebrate the truths that were recovered during the Reformation, whether it be things like law and gospel as a way of interpreting the scriptures, or uh, the theology of two kingdoms, the two kingdoms theology that tells us basically how we can live in a world in which we're citizens of one country and yet citizens of God's kingdom, or the theology of the cross versus the theology of glory, the doctrine of vocation. There's so many great truths that were recovered from the scriptures during the Reformation, and it's really why we gather each year to celebrate those truths and hopefully to trumpet them loud enough that they become part of the mainstream conversation within broader Christendom that so often gets distracted by many lesser things other than the true word of the gospel. And so with that being said, we're going to go over a passage today that frankly is so significant to the Reformation that the Reformation may not have happened without it. What passage am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about uh, Romans chapter 3 verses 19 through 28. Now, why is that so significant? Well, it really does explain a lot for us about the central question driving the Reformation. In fact, it does it so much that Luther would refer to this passage as the very heart of the gospel, and therefore we can extract from that the very heart of the Bible. Now, why would he say that? Well, because this passage answers the central question that drove all other reformers, but especially more than anyone, Martin Luther. And that question was, how is it that a sinner, a sinful person like you and I, can be made right, can be declared right, before a holy God who has declared in his word that he can have no fellowship with sinners. How is it that a holy God can acquit a person like me of all my misdeeds and thought, word, and deed and make me fit for his kingdom? That's the central question that Romans 3 seeks to answer. Now, uh, most people would say in response to that question, well, I guess ultimately it's going to come down to whether my good outweighs my bad. That's almost the instinctive thought of every human being as they think about encountering God. If there is a God, they say to themselves, well, as long as I'm not as bad as so-and-so, usually they compare themselves to others. That's sort of the judgment scale. As long as I'm better than this person or that person, or at least as long as my good is better than my bad, then I'm sure God will look at that and judge on a curve and allow me into his heaven. But of course, this completely ignores the primary purpose of the law, which is the standard for determining whether someone is, in fact, good or bad. Because we assume that the reason God ever gave his law was so that we could live up to it, to show our obedience. But the fact is, in Scripture, especially in this passage, what we're told counterintuitively is that this law, which we can use to judge whether we're good or bad, was actually given to show us how disobedient and bad we naturally are in thought, word, and deed. Now, again, I know this is counterintuitive, but this is what the Apostle Paul says in verse 19. He says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now why? Why does it do that? So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Now, why would every mouth be stopped upon hearing the law of God preached to them? Because everyone with a mouth has fallen short of obeying that law. Yeah, I'm afraid the answer that our good just needs to outweigh our bad is entirely misguided because it turns out, as James says in his epistle, That if we've even broken one law in the sight of God, it's as if we've broken it all. 
Thus, Jesus can say, if you're not perfect, as your heavenly father is perfect, you don't make the cut. If you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself completely from start to finish, again, in thought, word, and deed, then you don't make the cut. And so your obedience is not going to work at all. As the Apostle Paul will go on to say, you are not good enough, you are not smart enough, and doggone it, there's probably more people that don't like you than you realize. Well, so then the the second answer that people have tried to give is something that's kind of a combination of the two. They'll acknowledge the need that God needs to be involved somehow in saving us. He needs to do some things. But it's also up to us in order to make sure that we do the best we can. So whether it's Benjamin Franklin saying God helps those who help themselves or the founder of the Mormon church, Joseph Smith, saying that uh, God will give us uh, grace after we've done all that we can do, whatever the case may be, this is sort of a combination of the two. It's a, it's kind of almost an infused grace view of how one might be acquitted and declared righteous in the sight of God. And why is this view appealing? Well, because even as Christians— We really would like to believe that the law becomes attainable. We desperately want a law that we can fulfill. But once again, when we do that like the Pharisees and the Sadducees of Jesus' day did, we end up misusing that word. It's not what it's intended for, folks. As the apostle says in verse 20, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, not a single one since through the law comes knowledge of sin. In other words, what Paul is saying is that the law is like this mirror that reflects back to us the state of our soul apart from God. And what we see is something ugly. What we see is something much uglier than we ever want to really admit we have to see. Because it turns out that the confession of the tax collector who simply says, have mercy on me, the sinner, recorded for us in Luke 18, is ultimately what the law is there to get us to say as well. Because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Nevertheless, we are always prone, especially those of us who have been preachers, to wanting to preach a law that is attainable because we're tempted to get our people that we minister to in shape. We see their continuing sin We see their continuing habits and them not seeming to get more sanctified, not seeming to get as holy as we want them to be. And so we think that we need to, well, we need to make the law something that they can attain. And so we preach a cheap law, as John Dink called it. But my friends, that's not going to fly either. It's not what God's law is intended for. As John writes, Cheap law weakens God's demand for perfection and in doing so breathes life into the old creature and his quest for a righteousness of his own making. And what I am telling you is this, what doesn't kill him makes him stronger. Lowering the bar lets the old Adam peek into the promised land. It allows the flesh to survive by rebelling in a form of external piety. Cheap law tells us that we've fallen, but there's good news. We can get back up again. It makes the empty promise of resurrection through our improvement instead of our death. Folks, you want to know what the law is there to do. It's there to kill any illusion that we can save ourselves or that we can contribute to acquitting ourselves before a holy God. And so it's pretty clear that the law is not going to do it because we can only say it best with the clash. I fought the law, but the law always wins. And so what do we need? Well, we need to be saved entirely by someone outside of ourselves. This is the great news of the gospel. As the apostle Paul says in the very next verse, but now, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, having nothing to do with obedience to the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, that's true. They talk about it. They prophesy it. But our obedience to the law is not going to contribute to any of this. No, no, no. No. What is the good news? The righteousness of God? What is it? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his Grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
Yes, indeed, that word grace couldn't have come at a better time. How does God save sinners? By his grace alone. By his grace as a gift. Yes, you will not do it by yourself. No, you are justified by his grace purely as a gift and only a gift. Yes, this is what the gospel declares to us, and it is what we celebrate as we go into Reformation weekend. But someone will say, okay, if God's just going around forgiving sinners willy-nilly with his grace, doesn't that undermine his justice? I mean, how can he forgive sinners and still be just to sinners? And Paul's answer is, on account of Jesus Christ and what he accomplishes. This is what he says in verse 25. God put forward Christ as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now, don't skip past that word propitiation too quickly. Because that word is is a word that just means like pacifying sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that pacifies the wrath of God. But actually, the word has its root in the same Hebrew word that was used to describe the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you think back to the Old Testament, what happened at the mercy seat? Well, it was the cover. It was the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. And what God commanded the people of God to to do in order to be forgiven of their sins in a temporal way was to take the blood of a sacrifice and spray that blood on top of the mercy seat. And then on account of the blood being sprayed in the place where mercy needed to be given, needed to be extended, then the people of God would have access to their God. Now, Paul uses this word very intentionally because this is exactly what Jesus has done for us, but in complete and total fulfillment, never to be repeated again. He says this, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, please make note that by God taking out his wrath on the cross of Christ, he maintains his justice. And yet, because Christ has absorbed all of the justice that we were due, now God is able to extend mercy to all who believe in his son, Jesus Christ, and what he's accomplished. And that's what Paul really highlights next. Luther said it this way. He said, Our most merciful Father, seeing us to be oppressed and overwhelmed with the curse of the law, sent his only Son into the world and laid upon him all the sins of all men, saying, You be Peter that denier, Paul that persecutor, blasphemer and cruel oppressor, David that adulterer, that sinner who ate the apple in paradise, that thief who hung upon the cross, and briefly, you be the person who has committed the sins of all men. See, therefore that you pay and satisfy for them. Yes, by this event, God maintains his justice while then being able to be the justifier of all those who believe in Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what Paul emphasizes, that what Christ has accomplished is received by faith apart from any works at all. In other words, how do we receive all that God has done for us in Christ? We believe it. We believe the word of promise just as the Old Testament saints did as they looked forward to what God was going to do for them through the Messiah. We look back to what God has done through the Messiah and we simply say to it, amen and amen. I accept this sacrifice as if it were my own so that I can stand before a holy God completely acquitted, declared completely and utterly righteous in his sight and thereby look to eternal bliss with him forever and ever. Yes, this is the gospel that was recovered during the Reformation and that we celebrate right now, dear friends. And I pray that is the case for you, that you are celebrating this gospel that is entirely 
entirely apart from works, entirely apart from the scales, entirely apart from anything you can do, Jesus Christ declares sinners who believe in him justified before the sight of God, acquitted and ready for eternity even now. With that said, I hope you have a great Reformation Day. I'm looking forward to a great conference, and I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.